Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's Specifying Practice Group. Uh, with that, I do want to send this over to Dave and Lewis to get started with the session, as we tend to usually run over the hour. So, Dave and Lewis, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, everyone, for attending. This is Dave, and coming to you from uh, cloudy southern New Jersey this morning. Uh, actually, a pleasant change in temperature. We're into uh, double digits today as opposed to single digits, which was quite a shock after coming off a 70-degree Christmas day. Lewis? I, indeed. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, moderating a little bit here. We had a cold early part of the week, but uh, it's cloudy because we're looking for some rain tonight. So, well, uh, why should we do it right the first time? Well, who likes doing it twice? I know I don't. Well, you know what? One of the bits of uh, fatherly advice that I give to my sons, I don't have any daughters, is uh, was that uh, I said the fastest way to do anything is to slow down, take your time, and do it right the first time. Because if you don't have time to do it right the first time, you sure don't have time to do it twice. You know, and that's usually what we're facing at, as we get close to project deadlines. It's always, uh, you know, hurry up and get it done. But then the uh, as you're approaching that deadline, the very next thing you hear is, oh, we have a planned addendum. Wait a minute. <laughs> you haven't issued the documents yet. How do you have a planned addendum? <sighs> the, uh, the, uh, there's a... The construction specifications uh, LinkedIn group has having a discussion on what is the uh, section that you loathe to specify most. It's an interesting discussion. And today, our good friend Sheldon from the North Woods uh, stated that it's the section that they all of a sudden decided on that they need the day before the project is to go out. <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. So, Lewis, I want to say here, the very first way that you can get started is start day one, right? I think you, know? you can even I think you can even get started analyzing the project before you start sketching. Yes. You're going to have, uh, many of the larger projects are going to have OPRs, uh, owner project requirement documents, statements, and uh, even if it's not a formalized document as such in your informal discussions with the owner, they're going to tell you what they want. You know, if you're working with somebody who wants a, a traditional building, they're going to let you know they want red brick and limestone. Uh, if they're uh, a real forward-looking high-tech building or a company, they're going to tell you that they want something like that. Well, there's no reason why you can't start with Uniformat and start a PBD to start recording those decisions and those bits of information that you have from the client and say, okay, exterior walls, well, we're going to have two or three types. One of them is going to be this, one of them is going to be that, just the way you've kind of given us an example with uh, roof decks. Yeah, and this was actually an example right out of one of our projects that we had done. And, and it was, I think it's a convenient way to start documenting those that terminology that hopefully eventually shows up on the drawings uh, when you start doing the construction documents because now you've identified it as a green podium roof or a green uh, in t a garden podium roof. The only one that leaves a little bit maybe to be desired is the other roofs. I certainly don't want to see that on a document. But we have we we have them numbered roof system one, two, and three. So those work just fine for identifying the different roof systems on a drawing. Uh, we and I agree with you, Lewis. At day one, the owner has the idea. I need a building we can start documenting some of these very early decisions and their requirements and start the path for setting up the terminology that we should be seeing on the drawings. The biggest difficulty that I see um, in developing this early information, maybe because I'm sitting as a consulting specifier and we don't always get involved day one, but Oftentimes, I see that this this kind of information is not well circulated to the project team. So they may not even be aware the document exists and the start of the terminology is already set. 
Yes, it, it, uh, one of the uh, things that now are, is available for many firms is uh, project information management software. Uh, my firm, for example, uses New Forma, and so anyone in any of our offices across the country, or even our office in Shanghai, can dial, can uh, access uh, that document and find the files that they need. And one of the things that we've, I've been meaning to maybe share with this uh, august body is a concept that uh, I've got some of my teams experimenting with using uh, Microsoft OneNote as a, uh, a method of creating a project notebook to record decisions, information, you can put uh, pictures and from uh, the internet on it. You can, and when you import something from the internet, uh, like a product information or uh, even a detail, it, OneNote will automatically uh, put in a hyperlink back to the website. But uh, I'm getting off a bit. The, the main point is that there are methods now that we can electronically share this information. It doesn't have to live in a three-ring binder that's on the shelf in the project manager's office that's locked when he's out of the office. And one of the things that we're experimenting, again, because we're consulting and not sitting in the architect's office, is we're looking at things like Google Sheets or Google Docs as a way to collaborate so that if we're developing the preliminary project description or a table of contents or any other document that might help in determining some of this terminology that we're putting it out on Google where everybody on the team has access and everybody can contribute, modify, and, and keep the thing up to date as need be. So, hey, Matt, could we put up our first poll for today? Um, and while he's doing that, Kevin O'Baron has a comment. He says, what our team often does to try to get the whole design team on the same page with respect to terminology is prepare a project terminology memo and circulate it to the team. It's more succinct than expecting them to read through an entire design report, which may be hundreds of pages in length. And that's certainly right. That you know, it's, that we need to get that stuff out in front of people that applies to this specific project, rather than necessarily projects in general. Okay. So, how are we doing on this poll? We've got we've got about a third of you that have uh, made a choice. So, it'd be great to see everybody weighing in on this. Okay. We'll give it a minute and see how this shakes out. We're up to 50%. Come on, everyone else, let's get in on this. <laughs> this is not a political poll, you realize. It doesn't have to be a 7% response rate. Okay, we're at just about 75%, and it looks like uh, the clear winner is uh, design narrative as, the, as a way to start communicating with the team and start looking at some of these, uh, the terminology that might go forward. Uh, I like the fact that we also had a uh, spec table of contents and outline spec because early on they may, they may be a, a big help. Lewis, what the happened problem. to the PPD here? Ah, well, we were trying to push that. David and I are actually co-chairing the task team for the institute that is updating PPD format, uh, the, the uh, Institute's publication on how to do preliminary project descriptions. Um, it is still a fairly new, I, I've been doing it since the concept was introduced back in the manual practice that was published in 1989, and I started doing it pretty much right after that. Um, but we still got to some ways to go. The problem with the design narrative that I see is that those they're primarily aimed at the owner, and they don't necessarily establish a set of terminology for things. Whereas if you nor do the outline spec or the spec table of contents, whereas one of the things that you can do in a PPD 
is, as we talked before, you can have exterior wall type 1, exterior wall type 2, roof type 1, roof type 2, and you can begin to figure out, well, how many walls do I have to design? How many roofs are am I going to have? And start thinking about it that way and, and what those roofs and those walls need to look like and do in a functional manner before you start figuring out what products you need to make them work. Right, because you don't need to know everything from day one. You document <laughs> what you know when you know it. Uh, Ron Ray asked the difference. Ask what is the difference between a PPD and a design narrative? The PPD is uh, organized by unit format and has a specific structure, whereas design narratives are idiosyncratic and they vary from one firm to the other, um, and they tend to be kind of over the river and through the woods narrative text whereas a PPD is usually more in an outline or matrix format that is very brief and terse and just uh, establishes uh, the, the basic minimum stuff. Okay, so um, Matt, I don't know if we're uh, off of the poll, but if we're back to the screen. Okay. Scott Anderson so, says, as an outside consultant, I sometimes have trouble finding out even the name of the project during schematics. Can you oh, identify that's, that's with that, David? Sad. <laughs> uh, pretty sad, but it could be true. Okay. Uh, I, I want to suggest that as uh, specifiers, we're actually probably in a very good position to be able to help set some of the terminology and because specifiers have to be able to pick up the drawings, be able to identify what's there, be able to uh, collect enough data that we can eventually put together a table of contents to be able to write the uh, construction specs. And while we're doing that, uh, what I end up uh, doing is documenting more than just particular spec sections, particular spec numbers. Uh, what I'm looking to try to do is see if we can identify what actually is getting specced in a particular section. I would go to this level. This happens to be an example out of a um, uh, Veterans Affairs uh, Medical Hospital uh, project where they give you the list, the table of contents. It's all in a uh, word table form. So we're just adding uh, information into the table of contents to say, yes, it's gypsum board section, but what all are we actually going to specify? And we're trying to arrange it so that the headings, everything ahead of the colon, uh, becomes the terminology that we're expecting to see on the drawing and that we will document in the specification. So it's a way to communicate what we found or what we are uh, surmising will be required and a way to get the architect to respond to say, no, we don't need it. I have a very similar thing that's uh, in the form of an Excel spreadsheet that lists not only all of the spec masters that, that the firm already has and kind of their content so people can uh, add or delete uh, what needs to be in the individual sections, but I also list a number of sections that we don't have spec masters for but which might be needed uh, to try to to uh, spur people to think, oh, maybe I need that and maybe I because we don't have a spec master, we need to work on that one early. Uh, we need to get caught up with a couple of comments, David. All right. uh, Rick Let's, Lebb go ahead. says uh, that they actually do a detailed cost estimate using, using BSD cost link uh, assemblies at this stage at, at schematic uh, since the principals see the building already built in our mind's eye. And that's kind of the whole idea of the PPD is to write it as if the building already existed. Uh, Mike Chapp, who is going to be a guest speaker for us, we're going to, uh, he's an expert on uh, lean architecture and design, and we're going to get him to speak to us later this winter. Uh, we're planning a session here in a month or two. 
comments that um, his firm issues a PPD, it's schematic development. And what I like is that by not deleting what we're not using, rather than saying not use, it's a visual reminder and a record record to the client or contractor of what we're not doing as well as what we are. And sometimes the, you have to uh, say some negative things to clarify what the positive things are saying. Uh, Wayne Yancey says he did his first PPD in 1990, well, that's when I started, with long gaps between subsequent PPDs. I will unilaterally decide if I use a PPD or an annotated table of contents or outline spec. Okay. Okay. Well, funny you should mention Excel, <laughs> Lewis. This looks familiar. Yes, this looks familiar. This is our Excel uh, table of contents, actually, that we use. And you notice in the first column, uh, green dots, check marks, and we have a couple of other things that show up there. Uh, the first column is actually a selection column. So uh, one of our commenters suggested that he doesn't delete anything. Neither do we. We use the selection column. It's either in or it's out uh, by some by some form of selection, and then we just filter the file to show those things that are actually selected. So what we're also doing is if you notice the title right at the top of the I guess third column in it says section title and keynotes and then the far right title section work results we're taking a little bit different tack that we're trying to identify uh, the actual keynote uh, text within the table of contents and we're trying to build this as we go along so that it becomes somewhat standardized and I, this is one point that I don't know uh, that I've seen others actually trying to accomplish this yet. And I'm curious as to whether or not anybody else is uh, working a table of contents similarly. As I say, you know, I have a spec work plan that uh, people use here that is very similar. To, well, I call that column content or spec content. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised that no one has uh, sent in a question yet asking what a baguette is. Isn't that a uh, lunchtime treat? <laughs> it is a, a chewy, long loaf of French bread. <laughs> okay, so what I actually we're looked up in my Naywick construct, uh, construction dictionary, a baguette it is defined as a small molding of the astragal type, sometimes embellished by carving. And when they say astragal, they mean a, uh, a small linear uh, convex molding shape. Okay, well thank you for that. Uh, what, what we're trying to do with these um, uh, work results is we're actually trying to identify the kinds of things that might appear in the specification summary article. And we're also trying to use where we can the terms that may be the uh, terminology that appears on the drawings. What it I should be used on the yeah. drawings. Well, the philosophy being that if you find something on the drawing that you can turn to the spec and at the very front end of each spec section find that same terminology to know that you're in the right section. Yeah, I see the, I, David and I were talking the other day that, you know, all the words in uh, Moby Dick are in my Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary on my shelf, but they don't tell the story by themselves. You have to put them in sequence to tell the story. And there's a sense in which specifications are the glossary, the lexicon or dictionary for the story that is being told in the drawings. And that's why drawings are incomplete, because we have to know what is the meaning of the terminology that points to identifying the constituent components of assemblies and systems. Would that be this? <laughs> Indeed it would. Okay, so one, one um, troubling point that we've had with uh, keynoting is that 
we f we find on the drawings that sometimes the notation gets to be really quite specific, and rather than a broader uh, term that might be more applicable, at least more applicable in trying to relate a specification uh, to the the particular product or the project as a whole. And what I've taken to to do is the keynoting that we ending up developing, you can see a keynote number in the on the left, and where we're using an alpha uh, character, we're trying to keep all of those keynotes very broad so that it may be able to apply, in the case of wall panels, it may apply to multiple different kinds of wall panels, and where we're using uh, a, a numeric uh, second digit for the keynote, we're trying to get a little bit more specific to accommodate a particular project or a particular need on the project. So we're, we're finding that this is maybe a happy medium between the two, as this way the design teams can choose one or the other, or they could use some of each, uh, as it may be appropriate. One of the uh, problems with using numbered keynotes is, as you say, they can get too detailed if they are directly based on your specification sections, your specs, spec masters, for example, uh, especially like I'm, what always comes to my mind is uh, low slope roofing and in particular single ply roofing. That if you're a subscriber to master spec or, an, and, or even to have written your own office masters, you may have different sections for thermoplastic versus EPDM versus PVC versus whatever for all those sections and you don't know you're pretty sure it's going to be a single ply roof but you may not know which type it is until you're into CDs and it could even change it during CDs from uh, going through a value analysis product or uh, process or one thing or another, the contractor, uh, construction manager may have some influence and say, well, I'd really rather use this type of roof than that one and have to make a change. So that is an issue with, with keynoting that occurs for certain products. Right, and one of the things that we've experimented with and we don't have any kind of consensus from our clients yet but the keynote number uh, that we're using is really uh, an organizational number. It's not necessarily a number that's going to appear on the drawings, but a way to try to help uh, satisfy the concern you just raised, Lewis, is looking at using keynote numbering and dropping the last two digits of the master format number. So I if we understand. add wall panels is 0742, then it can work with whether it's terracotta, it could work with its metal, whether it's ACM, it doesn't matter. It's still in the same family under master format. I actually did that um, uh, at my previous firm in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s. We, we experimented with that, but uh, the overwhelming majority of folks would rather have natural language notes rather than numerical notes at that firm. We and fortunately in Revit you can choose. <laughs> yes, One, the other, or both. Um, we need to get caught up with a couple of comments. Um, Dave Metzger says, how much asks, how much success have you had in getting your architect clients to use on the drawings the keynotes you identify on the TOC? Do they allow you or you and the project architects together to control the keynotes? Good question, Dave. And here's here's the um, the very short short answer, I suppose. The 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 luck so far has been spotty. Uh, I have one client that I am working with that has actually identified a current project as a uh, pilot for their firm. He is very interested in trying to um, adopt this the keynoting process, a keynoting process. Uh, across the all the uh, studios in the in the particular office, 
I've actually had another client where we experimented a different way embedding keynotes into the specifications and we actually generated the Revit keynote list. Uh, it worked on a couple of projects uh, and after those initial ones they have not bothered to do keynoting and I really haven't had a good uh, discussion with them about why they have abandoned it. Wayne Yancey asks you specifically, David, uh -oh. who is master and commander to basis of design components and terminology in your role as consultant? Uh, we're trying to do it as a cooperative effort, both uh, the specifier and the project architect. And that's why we're looking to do the things like Google Docs um, to be able to share that responsibility. We want, we want the architect to, to be involved. We don't want to necessarily dictate because they may have some specific reason for one term over another. So we try to do it with them. Hey, Matt, while we're uh, going through some of these questions, why don't we move to the second poll? And Lewis, you can keep going if there are any. No, that's a, that gets us pretty much up to Okay, good. Up to date. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a sore point. <laughs> While people are filling this out, uh, for the folks in the audience, one of my tasks, both in this firm and my previous firm, is I do a lot of the QC reviews, the off-team, extra set of eyes kind of review of uh, documents before they go out. And uh, I remember on a project at my previous firm where the same material or product on a one sheet had three different terms for it and the sheet was drawn by a single person. I was fit to be tied. Well, it does happen and it could be that it was drawn on three different weeks or <laughs> three different days. It could be. And, but, uh, and also, uh, Maintaining frankly, that consistency is tough. A lot of our younger folks will just uh, pull a term out of their hip pocket rather hip pockets rather than uh, open uh, a spec section or look at an industry standard to find out what the heck the rest of the world calls this thing that they need. Yep. Well, and I I think. The poll sort of points to the difficulty, don't you think, Lewis? That it does, yes. If um, not the majority, but if many of them are relying on each team to manage the process and there's no consistency among the teams within an office, it's tough to bring consistency, probably even to a particular project. And of course, in all fairness, leaving it to each team, that kind of gets back to what we were talking about earlier, that if you have exterior wall type 1, exterior wall type 2, sealant type 1, sealant type 2, that those are project-specific terminologies that, you know, are generic enough that they could be used starting in, in schematics and going all the way through CDs, but they are left to the team. They are not, in one sense of the word, uh, standardized term, terminology. Yep. Um, my good friend Dallas Elrod from Memphis says that uh, his firm is still trying to move in the direction of using, of the, using the numerical aspect of keynotes but they aren't there yet. He believes that as they possibly move towards eSpecs or some other similar program, it might come to fruition. Okay, Matt, are we back to the screen? And Michael Bensky points out uh, that eSpecs for Revit generates standard keynotes from master spec and also allows customization. So there are some tools out there to uh, try to make this coordination between spec terminology and drawing note terminology more uniform. Well, I want to move on to one of my personal crusades. Okay. Okay. As a specifier, what when when I first open up a set of drawings, especially if I'm looking at uh, late DD, early CD drawings, 
and I flip through, I usually get to a page that has wall sections. And it probably has four or five different wall sections on each page, or on, this, on a single page. So they're all lined up going across, and every one of these wall sections is fully labeled. Mm -hmm. Every item on each wall section is labeled. Now, as a specifier and as a contractor's estimator, what am I required to do? I must read every one of those notes for every assembly. Why? Because one of them may be different. So even though you go through the entire uh, sheet and you finally discover that the, the heavy labeling is nothing more than repetition, that we could do this so much more efficiently. If, if we think of producing drawings much like we do uh, partition schedules, where we're labeling it, we'll draw it once, we label it once, and then simply refer to it by, the, by whatever number or nomenclature you use to identify it. System one, roof system one. It works. You don't have to label everything and you simplify the drawing review because now all you have to do is identify what those uh, assembly snapshots are and simply apply them. If, uh, if the assembly changes, you only have to change it one place. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm convinced that in general we overdraw 15 to 20 percent. We draw things, and when I say overdraw, I mean over notate. That includes over notations. Uh, so stuff that the contractor simply never looks at or does not need to know, and it also sets you up to the problem that if you change it in one detail and you don't change it in another, then you've got a problem. Now, with Revit, by if you have the standardized notations in there, that's not so much of a problem. Right, uh, but, if, but if we can take the concept and simplify the notation, whether it's manually or automatically uh, generated, it really doesn't matter. We're still improving the readability of the documents. Plus, in this case, if you limit the labeling to uh, these assembly snapshots, that you can more efficiently coordinate the terminology because you're only concentrating on one uh, small piece of the drawing as opposed to every aspect of the drawing. We have a couple of more comments. Let me uh, get up to date. Uh, Kevin O'Baron says, keeping terms consistent in construction docs is vital for consistent interpretation. That becomes a really important important in resolving claims and disputes. It's embarrassing, so I hear, to find out that the other interpretations of your work in front of a judge or jury or arbitration board. So it's vital that all terms be consistent, including being consistent with the terms defined in the general conditions. And as the claims manager for my previous firm, I couldn't agree more. Uh, because even if they don't work against you in a claim situation, it just, you know, I'm very jealous of our professional reputation and using a stupid term on the drawings or an incorrect term uh, that's uh, out of, that's not in sync with the specs is going to result in unnecessary RFIs and it just makes us look dumb. I don't like that. Um, Joel Nemi says uh, that decades ago he'd decided to learn about spec writing after ch changing the hand-lettered terms that I had used on drawings in order to uh, match up with the principal's red mark changes. I thought it would be more interesting to do the red marking than the changing. <laughs> well, there's a motivation for becoming a specifier that I never run into. I had um, I'd worked for a firm in uh, Cincinnati that um, a couple of the uh, PAs would not allow their drafters to do uh, any notations at all 
and uh, they would write all the notes and only the notes that they wanted in red lines when they were doing their redlining. Um, Sheldon says, I'm convinced that much of the reason for redundancies and conflicts is that the team doesn't understand how documents are related. They don't know what goes where, and they don't know what everyone else is doing. The result is that everyone, in trying to make sure the contractor knows what to do, draws or says things that are already addressed. Uh, duplication and ambiguities. I think that's an excellent observation, and yes. it could and it could very well be true, Sheldon. Thank you for pointing that out because you have uh, oftentimes individuals preparing the drawings, working almost in isolation, even though uh, is part of a team, but they're working on a very particular drawing, very particular aspect of the project. And they want to be certain that everything is that they are trying to convey is supposedly clear, but by doing so, end up causing potential conflicts or over uh, stating some of the information. We have a couple of comments on Revit, and then we'll move on. Um, Dennis Elrod says that he just had a discussion in his firm about the same subject of over labeling. It's a constant problem in his office. He believes it is in part due to the way people work in Revit. And Eric Ledbetter points out that for those of you who use Keynotes integrated in Revit, you can, can you advise how process and workflow you build to check, you build in to check, and for checking quality control of the data and model components that's primarily built and modeled by staff that is not licensed or experienced enough in specifications. Well, that's that's the that's the that's where the rubber meets the road, Eric. And we'll try to give you give some pointers, but uh, it's a learning curve. Yep. So well, what are we looking at here, David? This snapshot well, assembly. This was actually uh, some. Uh, an assembly that I had one of our architects, or I asked one of our architects to create. We had written a, a PPD for a project, and we had all the text written. And I called, I called the architect, Peter. I called him up. I said, Peter, I said, I'd like you to do this assembly snapshot. And he had no idea what I was really asking for. So I'm trying to explain, and he didn't understand why I wanted it. Reluctantly, he sent this one. Now, this this is its schematic design. He sends me this detail, which <laughs> it's like, okay, it's Peter. I understand. You know, so I took the I took this drawing that he sent. I popped it into the PPD and sent it back to him. And the next day, I had a whole bunch more. The because I think what he what he ended up seeing was the power of taking a simple drawing like this to convey what he thought the project was going to be. You combine it with some of the words that we had in the in the PPD, and now all of a sudden he had a tremendous expression of what the owner requirements might be and what the contractor needed to price. Now what we talked about after the fact with Peter is here is a chance for you to start building a library because every firm does not reinvent the wheel every time and that you tend to see a particular firm uh, using the same sorts of assemblies they might put them together a little differently but they get familiar get familiar they get comfortable with certain products certain assemblies and they tend to reuse so if you can develop this as a library, it also becomes a library of your terminology. And then you can start to coordinate this library with that preliminary project description or with an outline spec and your final construction specs, and all of a sudden you've got a much better coordinated set of documents. So, Lewis, I know that you're yeah. writing PPDs. Are you using them to this extent where you're looking at uh, developing assembly libraries? We're not quite that sophisticated. I have uh, talked with some of our folks about that concept because, frankly, there's only there are fewer than 10 basic exterior wall types. And there's no reason why we couldn't 
pretty well standardize those. I mean, when I say basic wall types, uh, I mean the exterior cladding material. There might be dozens of cladding materials, but the basic wall construction. There's probably only half a, only a dozen of those. I mean, uh, only half a dozen of those. You think about steel studs and gypsum sheathing and air barrier and continuous insulation, and then you have something that you put on top of it, whether it's brick or metal siding or ACM or whatever. Right. So and what I yeah, and what I wanted to show here is essentially you have the same thing. So here are the three different roof types. They have them labeled. They actually have them labeled by system number, and you know, th this was the actual construction detail that resulted from that sketch that I just showed. Mm -hmm. You know, so the the text was a little bit simplified. I think he realized he went a little bit overboard. Even for a schematic design, he went way overboard. But, yes. <laughs> but he got the point across. You know, so now he got the text down to what he actually needed to convey how to build um, the project and something to this effect and this level of detail would probably be superb uh, to be able to attach to a preliminary project description. Okay. okay. And uh, well, if we could eliminate the couple of words that I highlighted. <laughs> we, won't run into we won't run into <laughs> problems if we were change uh, insulation types later in the in the project and if we change the uh, roofing membrane type and later exactly exactly um, let's get caught up with some uh, questions and comments um, uh, Mike Smith addressing the, the last question about the uh, master keynote legend in Revit says you can select the keynote and highlight in the model Model. Uh, this is a useful tool for building information managers. Elias Salt says, I deal with a staff member here who unfortunately refuses to change how he notes drawings. No matter how many times I tell him, somehow he refuses to believe that both sides is two words. I'd like to be able to write all the notes on his drawings and just let him do the graphics. Well, we, yes, we all know folks like that. Uh, Todd Hansen says, what I see in our firm is staff copy a detail to create a derivative detail for a special condition, and they copy all the notes from the prime detail. Uh, it is easier for them to leave the repetitive notes in, and so you wind up with things that aren't right. Um, let's see. Um, right, so I think that goes to what the the image I'm showing on the screen now where you you see essentially the same thing. The, the exterior wall got copied. All the notes that were with it got copied where we could just as simply identify exterior wall one or whatever it might be yes. and eliminate all the notation. As uh, James Shade points out, copy and paste leads to over detailing and notation. Yep. So, Matt, we're coming close to the end here, I think, so let's put up the next poll. Um, James Shade also points out, says, the uh, desire to be clear is absent in the thought process of many CAD and BIM drafters. It's more the desire to fill the sheet. A little follow-up is attempted to make one sheet match another, especially when changes are made. One of these days, we might have to do a session on the uh, on redrawing. And one of the things that I've identified is that that sometimes people just like to fill up the paper to impress the, the client, even though it's wasted effort and wasted wasted time and costly. But, yes, it is. And we're going for 100% participation in this poll. Come on, <laughs> folks, you can do it. Uh, what I tell people is don't draw ahead of your either your A, knowledge base, or B, decision, project decision base. Just don't do it. Don't yep. draw it. If you can't draw it right the first time, don't draw it. Wait. Okay. So I guess this, this poll, um, Matt, if you want to go ahead and display this, uh, 
I don't see that there's really any surprise here because it's the project architect engineer that's here, you know, day day in day out dealing with the project, and they're the ones probably trying to control it to the greatest extent. And the specifiers, I know from my own experience, we're in the project, we're out of the project, we bounce back and forth, and the likelihood that we're there trying to control it is much, uh, much less than the project architect that's there every day. So, Lewis, who in your firm is trying to manage all of this? Oh, it's 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 primarily the um, the individual project architects. Uh, our project managers tend to be um, a little more distant from the, the actual production of the documents than in some firms, and um, we don't have a single specifier as such. I manage the specifications program. I keep the spec masters up to date and write custom sections, but I don't produce specs for individual projects. Um, we're in the process of trying to hire a new uh, quality director for the firm uh, that uh, to maybe iron out some of these difficulties and implement some more uniformity into our systems and approach. Okay, so Matt, let's uh, go back to the presentation. Um, Louis Schlachter asks, um, can you also ask if the detail includes too much real estate? Zoom in further so the detail focuses on the reason for the detail. Yeah, another one of my one of my bait noirs in looking at documents. We did a project uh, about um, well about the, the time I started here about seven or eight years ago, and I was looking at and uh, you look at the the wall section, and it took you to a detail, and then from that detail it went to a blow up on another sheet, and then that blow up took you to still another blow up on another sheet and one of the concepts that uh, we are now experimenting with in uh, trying to implement some lean practices into our firm is what we call drawing in context so that you have a wall section and the details associated with that wall section are on the same sheet so you don't have to send the contractor flipping through a hundred or more sheets just to find out uh, where the sealant goes or where the flashing terminates. And I, I like that approach, Lewis, except that I would add that there are several uh, places that you may want to standardize details across uh, several different conditions. And I have one client that does uh, gathers all of his roofing details in one location, which is convenient because you have you want to you want to know about roofing. You know that you can go to that page and find virtually everything that you well, want. It, there are yes. I mean, we don't do it on every aspect, but as we work around the building, uh, I mean, we'll have to show when we get Mike Chapped in here to to talk. Uh, we'll, okay. That's one of the concepts we'll we'll evaluate. Um, so pressing on here, uh, Mike one Smith uh, says that uh, the question of who is in, you know, managing these uh, term the terminology kind of thing. He says that's why he utilized the term building information manager in one of his previous comments, as opposed to specifier. It's a little more than just managing the specs, but also having a hand in the QA of the model and how it relates to the specs and. We certainly agree with you on that one, Michael. It's, uh, I used to walk through the drafting room and say, draw it the way I write it, boys. Draw it the way I write it. Yep. So one one thing that we try to do, and, and this goes back even to the table of contents as I start doing uh, the drawing review, I'm trying to identify the tagging, whatever that might be, whether it's uh, wall type one, whether it's ceramic tile type one, and start to gather that information so that I can include it in the summary article to be able to, again, help uh, contractors and estimators know that they found the right location in the spec. So if, if a tag's being used on the drawing to bring that tag into the spec 
try to help tie the two together rather than making them guess. Uh, and then the terminology that we use in the summary article that is in essence gathering everything from the drawings, trying and not always 100% successfully, but trying to use those same terminology in part two products, especially at the article level heading so that the products are easy to find, easy to identify. Yes, uh, just today I was updating the, our, the uh, spec master for uh, style and rail paneling and I put in a little note under the section that includes I said, you know, tell the contractor where this is, that this is the wood paneling in the boardroom at, you know, on such and such a level or you give the room number even. I like that idea. Thanks. Well, I, you should. I got it from you. I stole it from you. <laughs> I do like that idea. Um, um, Mike Chap points out that the most recent AIA Handbook for Professional Practice uh, discusses uh, drawing in context, uh, called working in context, also, and also has a section on lean architecture. And one of the other aspects that we see it in reviewing drawings, and Lewis, you mentioned it, right? Um, things like the the multiple words being used uh, for the same sort of thing. Yes. And where, where we find it, we do try to see if we can start to um, identify it in the spec. And, you know, it, for instance, gypsum board is probably one of the main culprits in this kind of thing because it has so many different names. So if we see both gypsum board and drywall on the drawings, we may try to identify drywall in a parentheses as as an optional term that may be found on the drawings. Uh, yeah, I have a few notes in my spec masters along those lines to, to try it's, to clarify things if the, if Anyway, but not, that's a good idea. Not the best solution. The best no, solution is get it, get the drawing right, rather than trying to compensate. But if, depending upon how far along you are in the process, it may help to avoid uh, some conflicts too, rather than trying to go back and find every instance. So. Uh, coming down here to the end, one of the things uh, that these are the things I guess that I'm trying to suggest uh, that we look at to try to make keynoting worthwhile. Uh, I say I want to see keynoting as universally reusable. So if we can keep terminology at a high level so that regardless the project, regardless the spec section, if we can use it at a high level, it can always be reusable. If we make it very specific, it becomes very difficult to make it reusable. In other words, like a single ply roofing system on tapered insulation as opposed to uh, TPO membrane on uh, two layers of TPO of uh, polyiso insulation with cover board. Yes, or any one of these. <laughs> That's often common. And you know, there, there are so many ways to call it out. Like you're saying, you may find even on the same sheet, coping or metal coping or aluminum coping. Oh, you missed, so, the, you missed one that is uh, one of my bait noirs. And that is? Pre-finished metal coping. Now, to me, pre-finished metal is the stuff that you start, that you paint, and you finish later. But some people think it means factory painted. <laughs> okay. So, so, so what I'm suggesting is. Of course, I'm the kind of guy that thinks that precast concrete is the gray soupy stuff in the truck on the way to the job site. I see. All right, so what I'm suggesting, at least the terminology, the term coping is something that's reusable. And if we have multiple kinds of coping on a job, we can label them coping one, two, three. It doesn't have to be terribly descriptive. Oops, let me get the right way. Because if we get into the spec and we have the same terminology, 
we can identify what that coping is. We don't have to get into that level of detail on the drawing. Which is exactly what I was trying to say earlier, that you can start doing at the schematic phase level by saying wall type 1, wall type 2, and coping type 1, coping type 2, and just establish that those are different things, and the specs are the definition, they're the dictionary, the lexicon, to explain what those terms mean. Wade Bevier says, is this common terminology international? And uh, that's an excellent question, and that's, I think, one of the goals of the Omni class is that if you stop and think about it, the various tables, whether it's master format, unit format, or there is a products table, I don't remember what the number is, that there are people that are spending a lot of time and energy to try to figure out what is the right word or phrase to describe these different bits and pieces that make up construction. And uh, so the, we are, have the opportunity to become more standardized because of these publications, but it's a matter of disseminating that information to the, the folks in the trenches that are actually producing the documents. Well, and you mentioned OmniClass, and the products table is probably a great place to start, to go and look to see what the terminology is there, at least it is some, in some form a recognized uh, standard document that we could all start from. We may not agree with all the terminology and you may want to take exception and, and insert your own for a particular purpose, but if we can at least consider using what is already there, we may bring this to a better uh, uniformity across the entire industry. The main thing is to keep it simple. There's the, the, just identify the products in the simplest, most straightforward industry standard way that uh, we, we need to discourage people from writing specification type notes that are lengthy paragraphs on the details. Well, so I hope that this was uh, a bit of encouragement. We all, we, if nothing else, we all got to commiserate with one another because we, it's a problem in all of our offices, and we just need to try to raise people's awareness and consciousness level that they're not using the right words. Okay, right terminology. I, I want to recognize one comment that Sheldon made. Oh yeah. Uh, ba based on the coping example, he says it's better to say coping one at cavity wall parapet and coping two everywhere else. Sheldon, thank you. Residuary legatee, yes, you're absolutely right. And I apologize because I started out with coping one, two, and three and <laughs> deleted three and didn't go back and uh, update coping two to be everywhere else. Well, actually, that's what your, your example says pretty much, but. <laughs> So, but that's absolutely right. That way, no scope is missed. And uh, friends and neighbors, we have not a clue as to what we're going to talk about next month in February. So if you have any suggestions, uh, keep those cards and letters coming in. I beg to differ. I already sent in the description, and you were heading it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't get the memo. I know that. I'll share with you later. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining. And join us next month when you get to hear Lewis say, what's the topic of the presentation? <laughs> I don't know anything about that. <laughs> so thank you much. Our next uh, event is going to be February 4th, early in the month. So Lewis has precious little time to prepare. <laughs> but I'm always ready to share my ignorance. Uh, but with that, again, thank you, everybody, for attending. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again to Dave and Lewis, and we'll see you again next month.